Hello friends, I'm Pastor Robert Abner and I serve Lutheran Church of the Cross in Muncie, Indiana and Grace Village, which is the Lutheran Episcopal Presbyterian Campus Ministry at Ball State University. Welcome back. We've got another weekly video devotion lined up for you today and we're going to do something just a little bit different and I just want to talk a little bit about uh, things you may see in a church sanctuary. And for many of us, no matter what tradition we're from, whether we're some stripe of Protestant, be it Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist, Episcopal, Baptist, you name it, and even if you are a member of the Roman Catholic Church, many of your churches will always have this light shining in their sanctuary. It's a sanctuary candle, a sanctuary lamp, an eternal candle. It's usually almost always red, which I'm told has been uh, symbolic for the blood of Jesus. But you may have wondered from time to time, what is that candle actually there for? And it's really about as simple as you can imagine it would be, especially as we think of it as an eternal flame. But it is to symbolize to us that God is always in our presence. God is always here with us. And as you can see, our candle's getting a little bit low here. Some people have theirs plugged in and it's just an electric light bulb. Some people use oil in theirs, which requires a little more work. But uh, the church I serve here uses a uh, one week long candle. And so before I replace the candle that is about burned out, I'm going to light another one, keeping that symbolic presence of live as the light of Christ always in our midst. So we've got that one lit. Reach up here. They're always hard to blow out too, especially like the two week long candles. They're pretty long. There we go, second try. And we place the other one in there. Notice this, uh, the plastic that this comes in has a cross on it. And right there we go. Our eternal candle, our sanctuary light, our sanctuary lamp keeps going. And in this time of pandemic, this time of social distancing or physical distancing, it's, uh, it would have been just as easy to not worry about the lamp, right? It would have been just as easy to save money by not burning candles this whole time that we are not physically meeting in this space. But what does that say? I think it's important to remember that this light is always shining. Even if we are not always here, even if we can't always see it, the light is always shining because Christ is always present with us, because Christ is the light of the world. And so in thinking of that, I just wanted to share briefly the beginning of the gospel according to St. John. John's gospel, well known for being uniquely worded. Uh, we talked about it last Thursday on my Maundy Thursday sermon, but John being very unique compared to the other gospels. I invite you to listen and hear the beginning of John chapter 1, which many of you have probably heard. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. It goes on a little bit more, but this is the, the beginning narrative of Jesus in John's gospel. There's no birth story in John's gospel. There's no birth story in Mark's gospel. But this is the narrative of why Christ came into being. And you hear a lot of language that sounds very uh, unique to our Holy Trinity. We call that Trinitarian language. But we hear that in the beginning was the Word, okay? So take that and think about it. How does John's Gospel begin? What three words? In the beginning. Does it sound like something you've heard before? Maybe the book of Genesis. So the author of John's Gospel is trying to call us back to the book of Genesis, to hear those words, in the beginning. Because Christ has always been present because God has always existed in Holy Trinity. And so later on we will hear that that word 
that was in the beginning was with God and was God, we also hear that that word became flesh and dwelled among us. It's important to remember that. Oh, the humidifier kicked off. Put that one on the blooper reel. It's important to remember that the word was with God and the word was with God and the word became flesh. And it's important for us to remember that Jesus is the word of God, the living word of God. But what I want to focus on here is that last bit. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. My friends, this light represents that light of Jesus, that light that has come into our world, and that light that shines in the darkness, the darkness of this time of pandemic, the darkness of your time of health concerns, the, time, the darkness of the time of your financial worries, the light shines in that darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. Jesus will not leave you in the midst of the darkest times of your life. And so let that passage from the first chapter of John remind you of that. And any time that you see the candle in your own church sanctuary, let that be a reminder to you that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And if you're having a tough time at home right now, this whole time of physical and social distancing, light a candle. I know it sounds simple, and it may sound stupid to some of you, but light a candle. Let it be a reminder for you of the presence of God in the midst of all of this. So that's the sanctuary candle. One last thing I'd like to, to share with you before I wrap this video up, because I like to keep them short, much like my sermons. Um, this book was given to me. It's funny. I saw this book on my shelf. I was trying to find a prayer for today. And this is a, called a book of uncommon prayer. And I was sitting there wondering, I said, where did I get this book? Who gave this to me? And I'm always thankful when people give me books, but I like for them to maybe write their name or something inside. So I remember, and sure enough, I opened it and there was a sticker and I received this at the uh, Lutheran Campus Ministry Conference in Portland, Oregon that I went to back in 2018. And so I am thankful to my friends and colleagues in campus ministry who gave me this book. And I'm, I'm mournful that I will not get to gather with them this summer because of this pandemic that we find ourselves in. So our lives are all being affected in different ways. And I give thanks for my colleagues in campus ministry but I also give thanks for hospital chaplains, and that's something we've talked. We haven't talked about. I've been uh, praying for uh, healthcare workers and doctors and nurses and essential workers and and service industry staff and all these folks who are doing the best that they can to help keep us healthy and happy and and, and some sense of normalcy during this time of pandemic. But I haven't lifted up a prayer for the hospital chaplains, and so I invite you to join me. The job, job, that's a silly word. The call of being a hospital chaplain is a unique call indeed. And it requires someone to feel that God is calling them to that position. And let me tell you, who does not feel called to be a hospital chaplain is the guy that you're looking at here on screen. I had experience with hospital chaplaincy uh, through my seminary experience. We have to go through CPE, which is clinical pastoral education. And so I was an intern, chap, a cha, chaplain intern at Ball Hospital IU Health right here in Muncie uh, under two fine mentors, my friends, Pastor Cal Risman and Pastor James Hillison, who have since retired from the business. But uh, in that nine months of internship, I learned that I was not being called by God to hospital chaplaincy. And so I hold hospital chaplains in a very high regard. Shout out to a couple of my friends here at Muncie doing that work, Pastor Will Grinstead and Pastor Katie Johnston. So join me please as we pray for hospital chaplains in this difficult time who are doing their best to remind people in hospitals, those who are sick, lonely, afraid, struggling to, to maintain their life. Let us, may God be with those chaplains who are reminding those folks that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it.
<clears throat> oh Lord, we pray for hospital chaplains of any creed and religion and tradition and spiritual practice whatsoever. For they are the ones who knock gently on the doors of patients who are dazed and afraid and in pain and stick their heads in and ask gently if they can be of service and many times endure the lash of rude and vulgar response and have to accept that as the price of doing business, have to accept that as the price of doing business. And they're the ones who sometimes walk softly into the room and lay hands on hands or heads and whisper prayers and ask for blessings and healing and restored strength, if at all possible. And those are hard things to ask for when the being in the bed is so patiently broken and bruised and frightened and helpless, no matter how hard you pray or how huge your empathetic heart. And they are the ones who then knock on the next door and the next day after day, week after week, sometimes for many years, like a dear friend of mine who became a priest after a while just so he could bring the sacraments to those bedsides. They are great, sweet, patient, diligent, amazing people, these chaplains that we talk about. And on this day, in the chapel of the hospital with its huge windows and small, simple, unadorned crucifix, I pray for them with all my heart. And so, amen. My friends, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're staying safe. Pray for those who are out there working, providing care to people all across the globe. Stay safe, stay home, and may the Lord bless you and keep you until we see each other again.